the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. A grace, peace, and mercy be multiplied to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Today we have a continuation of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, a place uh, where Jesus shares many teachings and a location that is right on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. If you were to go there today, you could visit many places that are set apart to remember Jesus' ministry on that northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. You can go to the church of Tagba, a place that was built, a church built around a place where they found a mosaic, going back to maybe the third century A.D. On that mosaic, we have the imprint of the loaves and the fish, reminding us of Jesus feeding the 5,000. So there's a church there in Tagba. You go further up the road, you come to the church of the Beatitudes, again on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. That place is dedicated to remember the teachings of Jesus in this Sermon on the Mount that we focused on last week. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You go further up the road, you come to a place called uh, the Church and Monastery of Peter's Primacy. This reminds us of when Jesus... uh, had risen from the dead. He appeared to his disciples one morning after they had been out fishing on the Sea of Galilee. They come to the shore not catching anything, but there is Jesus cooking them a breakfast on the shore. Jesus approaches Simon Peter, who denied knowing Jesus three times in his greatest time of need. And Jesus asks Simon Peter three times, Do you love me? Three times Jesus said, Jesus is... Uh, Peter responds to Jesus by saying, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, Feed my sheep. Here, on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, those things have taken place. And I imagine, as the people are gathered on that day, they're listening to Jesus teach and preach, and they're looking down from the mountainside. Understand, mountains in Galilee, um, more like eastern coast United States mountains instead of western coast mountains, more hills than mountains, right? But high enough that you can look up, uh, you can be on that high point, you can look out on the Sea of Galilee. And I imagine as Jesus taught, what they could see is they could see the boats on the Sea of Galilee, the fishermen out doing their work, their livelihood in front of them. They could look and see the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, the place of the Gentiles, the place where the foreigners live, They could look to the western shore and see Tiberias being built by the Roman Empire, a place of commerce and business and empire. They could see, if you will, a microcosm of the world in front of them. And I believe those things that happened, the the feeding of the 5,000, the the blessings given to people, the, the charge to Peter to feed my sheep is understood to be for the all the world. And so Jesus shares with his followers today, he says to them, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. 
And I imagine when they heard that, they remembered how Isaiah had told the people the word of God. That you, people of God, have been blessed by God and God will bring you back to the promised land. And God wants to set you as an example to the world. You are the light of the world. You are to be a light to the nations. And so this word is now given to the people gathered there to let them know that this message is for them. And notice when Jesus says this, it's not, it's not a command. You must be the light of the world. You have to be the light of the world. You ought to be the light of the world. No. It's a promise. You are the light of the world. So what does that mean to be the light of the world? Well, first and foremost, we have to remember where that source of light comes from. That we are called to reflect the light. I'll share with you a story. On a dark, foggy night... A ship came upon a light of another vessel. The captain radioed his counterpart. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid collision. Through the crackly radio came the reply. Recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. The captain stood his ground. He radioed, this is the captain of a U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. Again came the reply. No, I say again, you divert your course. Outraged, the captain spoke loudly into the radio. This is the aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, numerous support vessels. I demand you change your course 15 degrees north, that is one five degrees north. Again came the reply, no, I'm sorry, this is the lighthouse, your call. (laughs) We're not the light, we're called to reflect the light. Jesus is the light of the world, and as we hear in John chapter 1, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. The light in the midst of the darkness, the hope in the midst of despair, the love in the midst of hate, forgiveness in the midst of brokenness, life in the midst of death. We are called to reflect that light. We're not called to be the source. Jesus is the light of the world that comes to shine his light in the darkest places of our lives to let us know that no matter how dark it may seem, God's light overcomes all darkness and darkness does not overcome it. We are forgiven, we are loved, we are blessed simply because God loves you. That is the light that shines in our life. And in response, we are called to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. I love to take pictures. I love photography. Uh, My wife and I went on vacation back in October, and I'm still working on editing pictures here in February. She wonders where those pictures are. But I like to go into Photoshop and fool with things with a, with a light, especially you can, you can adjust things when you're looking at pictures. And when you work with light, if you don't have enough light, what happens is you just get shadows and outlines of images. If there's too much light, it just kind of blinds the whole picture out. But if you adjust that color, that light just right, the vibrance of the beauty of, that, of God's creation, the images just seem to pop. And when light is like that, it just enhances the picture so that you can see the beauty of what you're trying to capture. You are the salt of the earth. Well, understand in Jesus' day, salt was a, a very precious commodity. Salt was used to preserve food, and if you had it, it was great to have. If you didn't, you wanted it. So cities, countries, empires were built on this commodity. Uh, the city of Salzburg is named Salt City. It was built some four centuries before Jesus because they had a great uh, amount of salt. They were able to trade with other people and they were powerful because of that. But today, when we talk about salt, we go to the doctor and the do- doctor says, salt is bad, right? <laughs> but the reality is, a good doctor shared with me yesterday that you need salt to live. Salt is a part of who we are. But we need enough but not too much. And the reality is, is when we cook and we use salt, we recognize salt when there isn't enough or if there is too much, right? 
But if salt is just right, it enhances the food and brings out the flavor. And I think that's what God is calling us to do, is to, to enhance the wonder of what God has created so that we can behold that which God has given us. We're called to be salt. We are called to be light. We're called to be witnesses to what God has done for our, in our lives. We're called to be evangelists. We're called the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. But evangelism kind of scares us, right? <laughs> How do we go and share the message of God with others? We get nervous about that. Later, the choir is going to sing, I love to tell the story, right? And we, it's not a question mark, it's an exclamation point, right? We're called to share the story of what God has given us. So how do we do that? Well, here comes your homework assignment for the day. The candles that I gave the kids, you all have candles at home as well. I know you do. So I invite you sometime this week to find a candle in your house, either by yourself, with your family. Take out that candle or take the candle that I gave the kids. They can use that one when they go home. And light that candle and ask yourself two questions. Where have you seen the light of God shine in your life this past week? Where have you seen the light of God shine in your life this past week? Maybe it's through the message of a loved one. Maybe it's through a smile. Maybe it's through a grandchild. Maybe it's through someone, a stranger, who just offered a smile to you. Maybe it's a kind word that was shared. Maybe it's the beauty of God's creation when you see the sunrise. Maybe if you love winter, it was the beauty of the snow. Maybe. <laughs> Where have you seen the light of God shine in your life this past week? And the second question, where have you allowed the light of God to shine through you this past week? Where have you allowed the light of God to shine through you this past week? Because you see, that's what God has created us to do and to be. It's to be who we are, how God created us to love and worship God and love and serve others so that we might reflect the light of God to others, so that we can share with others, this is where I see God active in my life today. This is how I can shine my light with others. And to use the gifts that God has given us to do that. When Jesus calls the fishermen, he calls them to be fishermen, to use their gifts to do God's work. God is calling you to use your gifts to do God's work. How can you allow the light of God to shine through you this week? As St. Paul says in our second lesson today, we don't need to use eloquent words, words of wisdom, but simply to share the message that Jesus Christ died, Jesus rose, and that's all that matters to me. And it means something to me today. So imagine if you will. Imagine if you will that you are like the disciples and the followers of Jesus this day, sitting on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Imagine if you will sitting in a place where you can see all the world. You can see the places of business and commerce. You can see the lands of the foreign, foreign lands. You can see the places where cities are growing up and empires are being built. In this world, the light of God needs to shine. And God is calling us to do just that. We need to be the ones to share the light to the world Light in the midst of darkness. Hope in the midst of despair. Love in the midst of hate. Forgiveness in the midst of brokenness. Life in the midst of death. Jesus' command, he gives one to his disciples on the night in which he's betrayed. Just one command, love one another. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Paul says to us, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. And again, St. Paul says, do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. That is the ways we can shine the light of God in our world today. Know that you are forgiven. Know where you are God's child. Know that you are the light of the world. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Amen.